I'd like to welcome John Flynn from Prezina Investment Management today. He is a principal and portfolio manager there. He's going to be uh, discussing with us the value advantage in small cap stocks currently. Um, John's cart, uh, colleague, Marty, is going to introduce him more formally. Um, so I'm going to pass it to Marty now. Um, one note is please put your questions in the chat. We have carved out some time for Q&A at the end. And so as, quite, as you think of questions, add them to the chat and we'll make sure to ask them to John um, at the end. Thank you. And with that, um, go ahead, Marty. Great. Thank you, Stephen. So on behalf of Pazina, we would like to thank both Stephen and the CFA Society of Pittsburgh for inviting us to the program today. We greatly appreciate it, and we look forward to an engaging conversation. As Stephen mentioned, my name is Marty Hanhauser with Pazina Investment Management. I work on our marketing and client service team. And before I turn it over to John, what I thought I would do is just give a brief background of who Pazina is for those of you that may not be familiar. Pazina was founded in 1996. Our firm is one of the premier value managers in the industry. As of the end of the first quarter of 2021, our assets under management was right below $50 billion, 49.2 to be exact. We manage, we manage a variety of different value strategies across the globe. U.S. value, international value, global value, emerging markets value. And the only thing we do is value investing. And a lot of people think that value investing is dead. They ask us how we have managed through the last 10 years with these challenging headwinds. And we've actually done quite well. The 2020 calendar year marked the fourth straight year that we had positive net inflows. And we actually had positive net inflows for eight out of the last 10. So we're pretty excited about the current opportunity and value. And what we thought we would do today was give you a little bit of background on the overall value opportunity, and then really dig into the value advantage in small cap stocks. And of course, we're open to Q&A throughout the presentation. And um, per Stephen's direction, we've left some time at the end. We built that into the presentation. So with me today, I'll turn over my colleague, John Flynn. John joined Pazina in 2005. He is a partner at the firm and one of the co-PMs on our small cap focused value strategy. I would be remiss if I did not touch on the performance of our strategy, given that this is one of our flagship um, strategies at Pazina that was um, incepted in 1996. If Tim could move to that slide here, I'll just point that out to show you um, the success we've had in this particular space. Um, we manage, um, our, our goal or objective is, of course, to provide excess return, and we've really done a great job with small cap value. This is offered in a separately managed account and also a pr proprietary 40 act mutual fund. So I'll turn over to John, and I'll remind you to ask questions via the chat. And if we don't get to them during the presentation, we'll, of course, dedicate the time at the end. Thank you again, and John. Great. Thanks, Marty. And, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today uh, for our virtual lunch. Um, I, I appreciate everyone taking the time. Um, you know, as, as Marty said, you know, at, at Pazina, we're one thing and one thing only. We're value investors. Um, and, you know, if you look across the academic literature, uh, you know, there's really two things that work well uh, over time is, is value investing and also small cap investing. And so I think the, the intersection that we have today to talk about small cap investing is uh, you know, a, a very uh, fertile ground for, for, uh, for investment. And uh, Tim, if we go over to the next slide here, um, this is just looking at the 50 years of the size advantage. Um, and you see that there's a nice outperformance in small cap versus mid and then mid versus large. Uh, this relationship but, uh, of outperformance from small cap actually, uh, you know, more recently hasn't been there. Um, you know, in the, the most recent couple quarters, we've seen small cap come roaring back. But, you know, Marty mentioned that we get the question, is value dead? Um, you know, and I think it's only because value has been so painful that we didn't get more of the question, is small cap dead? Um, but, you know, I, I think that my answer to that, both questions is no. I will get into that a little bit. Um, but we do think it's a very attractive area. Um, I think there's a couple misconceptions about small caps 
that that come about in the marketplace that we get questions about. Um, and two of the most common ones are that well, small cap companies are companies that don't have scale, and therefore they can't compete. Um, and, and what I'd say there is that oftentimes it isn't a fact that they're trying to compete with large cap companies. It's that the total addressable markets that they're serving, by definition, are much smaller, right? So they tend to actually you can actually find strong business franchises uh, that are just happen to be a smaller market cap. Um, it's not necessarily you're competing against the large caps. The other misconception you also I often hear about small caps is well, small cap companies grow up to be mid cap companies to grow up to be large cap companies. They have to be growth companies. You have to be a growth investor in small cap uh, in order to, to to really go where the successful companies are. And, and again, I come back to that point of it really depends what market you're addressing and how you're positioned in that. Um, and as you'll see as we talk through this um, and, and go through some examples, um, there's plenty of companies that I don't think anybody would call growth companies per se that offer great value opportunities in, in the marketplace. One of the neat things about small cap is that it's a 2000 stock universe as Russell defines it, right? And we define our product along the same parameters, ranks 1,001 to 3,000 by market cap rank. Um, our portfolios that we build are 40 to 50 stocks with kind of a three to five year investment horizon. Um, so out of those 2000 stocks, we're looking for maybe a dozen new names a year in terms of ideas. So we can be very picky um, and, and, and we are, and we can take our time to, to go after the most compelling opportunities. The other thing I would mention in the, in the small cap universe is that increasingly as we've had uh, the sell side coverage uh, business model just erode, Coverage of small caps has declined dramatically. And this is this is a phenomenon really over the past call it five to seven years, and as a result, more and more opportunities for for good fundamental research where nobody's doing their homework uh, creates somebody creates an opportunity for people willing to roll up their sleeves, dig through the the ten Ks and, and and find the data uh, and, and and do the homework. And so for us as a fundamental research team, we have twenty five people on our research team. We cover the globe across those 25. It's not just dedicated to small cap. Um, we're all based in New York. Uh, you know, we have the resources to go up and do the heavy lifting. Um, and it's really being disciplined in your approach uh, that really gives you this opportunity. On the value side of things, uh, just a quick word on, on what value investing is and isn't as we see it. Um, you know, we often use the phrase value is not a factor, it's a philosophy. Um, and at its heart, it's really as simple as arithmetic in that you're paying some price for some future stream of cash flows. And if you pay an attractive price for that stream of uh, cash flows, you'll make money. And if you don't pay an attractive price, your odds of making money are a lot less. Now, obviously, you have to do your work and forecast those cash flows and understand the business that's driving those cash flows. But that's, that's really uh, at its heart how we think about value investing. The, the problem with, with value investing or the challenge, I should say, you know, everybody who's in a long only seat is saying they're looking for good businesses trading at a discount to its, their intrinsic value. Um, you know, every, every long only, only manager will say that whether they're growth or, or value or, or whatever they are. But the, the real issue is that you never get a company, a good company trading at a substantial discount to what you think it's worth unless there's a big problem. Right? There's something that's caused the earnings to collapse, something that's caused um, you know, the market to lose faith in the company and, and, and trade the stock down. And it's very, very uncomfortable to go after these opportunities because they're often contrarian. They're often, uh, you know, in case of a large cap, you're on the front page of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, small cap companies tend to get buried a couple pages in, but regardless, uh, the news flow isn't typically good around uh, these companies when you're looking at them. And so you need to have a philosophy and a process and a culture that allows you to go after these um, opportunities. And that's what we've created at Pazina amongst our team it is, is a systematic process that really takes the emotion out of the investing process, focuses on the facts and, and the research, and then you know, attempts to make kind of a, a rational decision on the investment side um, 
And so I thought it'd be useful if I take you through kind of how that works and how we do that. Um, and then give you a couple examples uh, before moving on and we can talk about the general outlook uh, for small cap as we stand today. So if you flip over to slide six there, Tim, um, these are the general characteristics of something we're looking for in our investment uh, opportunities. Uh, the first two things here are, are quantitative in nature. Um, you'll hear me use the term normal earnings. Uh, that's our proprietary metric that we use to, to look at uh, evaluations of companies. You should think of that as a year five cash EPS number. So five years out, what is this company going to earn? Um, we will only buy things in the cheapest 20% of the universe on a price normalized earnings basis. That's our value discipline. And then the next thing here, the current earnings below historical norms, that's the problem, right? Earnings are chugging along, you're earning a dollar, dollar 10, all of a sudden earnings fall in half, something's happened, right? And so you can screen for these up front and, and we do. Um, the next three areas are where we really spend our time on the heavy lifting. Um, one is, you know, is the, is the issue temporary or permanent? You know, I mentioned that these things tend to be contrarian. And so very much they're viewed as permanent. And so going and figuring out that you can get comfortable that the issue is temporary isn't a trivial task. Uh, the next point here that the business is good, I think uh, goes after a misconception of value investing. I think a lot of times people say, oh, value investors like to buy things at 0.3 times book and hope it goes up to 0.4 times book and declare a victory. Uh, that's not what we do. We like to sleep well at night as well. Um, we define a good business as a business that earns its cost of capital over the course of a cycle. We recognize that not all business cycles fall neatly into quarters or years, um, but we do you know, take the approach of if, if we were to buy this position today and the market was to shut for the next three, four, five years, would we be comfortable holding this business? Um, and, and that's something we, we spend a lot of time thinking about. And then the last point here, downside protection, um, is a very important tenant of, of value investing. First and foremost, downside protection comes in the form of the valuation, right? By buying in that cheapest 20% of what you think it's worth, um, you're, you're ensuring you're getting in at what you think is a good price. But downside protection also takes the form of uh, you know, good balance sheets. Debt is very much the value investor's uh, worst friend. Uh, you can be 100% right about your analysis, but if you have a liquidity event in the time it takes for things to recover, um, then it doesn't matter uh, that you were right over the long term. We're also looking at some of the parts. We spend a lot of time thinking about what bad could look like and what the range of outcomes could be. And as a result, at the end of the day, you're creating a portfolio of skewed outcomes where if you're right, you make a lot of money. And if you're wrong, you don't lose that much money. Um, so maybe walking through how something gets into the portfolio uh, on the next page, you can kind of see the, the steps of the process here. Um, I mentioned, you know, we screen at, the, at the, the front end. We have a proprietary tool that we have called Stock Analyzer that looks at 10 years of history for every company. Um, so for all 2000 stocks in the small cap universe, we're looking at 10, 10 years of history, uh, if we have 10 years, or if it's not 10 years, it's less, we'll, we'll look at less, but 10 years of history saying, if we know nothing else and just assume these 10 years is a guide to the next 10 years, um, what does this company earn in five years? So if you have an 8% margin history, we'll take your margin back to 8% over the next five years, then you get your normal earnings estimate. Um, we then rank this entire universe uh, by price to normalized earnings, cheapest to most expensive. And we screen through the cheapest 20%, the cheapest 400 stocks. We do that as a portfolio management team. So uh, I have two co-PMs with me on the small cap strategy, Ben Silver and Evan Fox. And once a quarter, we lock ourselves in a room for a couple of days and go through that 400 stock universe and come up with a list of what's important or what's most interesting. Um, I think it's important to note here that we're doing the screen as a portfolio management team and we're not tasking analysts with sourcing ideas in their industry. That's a deliberate choice on our part to kind of empower the analysts to go after sort of the hairier, scarier stuff and not feel like they're taking career risk by proposing uh, something that, you know, might be deemed too scary or, or, or uninvestable. We want them to go look at the stuff that's, uh, that's screening the cheapest. 
Once the analyst gets the, the, the list of names, they then go and do what we call an initial review. Um, and they're look, tasked with answering three basic questions at this point. What does this company do? How does it make money? Um, you know, why does it exist? That's the first question. The second question is, what happened? You know, why is the stock cheap? Why did earnings collapse? And the third question is, what do we have to believe to get comfortable with this investment? The goal at this point isn't to uh, kind of answer all those questions per se, but it's kind of scoping out what a research project would look like and having an initial view on if we did this work, is it likely the stock is going to be in the cheapest quintile? What, is there an error in the data historically? Have they done a bunch of mergers and all of a sudden the history is not a good guide to what's going to happen in the future? So it's not really in the cheapest quintile. All of these things we're trying to, to identify at this initial review point. We then have the analysts bring it into our research review meetings that we have twice a week, where all the portfolio managers, uh, analysts that have covered the stock in the past, perhaps, everyone sits around the table and we debate the issues. Uh, and the goal of that initial meeting is to decide whether or not to do a full project. We kick out about 75% of names at this point in the process, kind of narrowing the funnel. Because if you think about the most scarce resource we have, it's, it's time. And so we're trying to sort of quickly get rid of stuff that's not compelling. Um, but in the case where we do go forward with the project, we leave this meeting with kind of a clear work plan on what the key issues we want to go research are. Um, and then sort of the analyst takes the charge in terms of running down those issues and resolving them, right? So if we're going forward, we're building out a detailed model at this point. We're talking to people in the industry. We're talking to experts. We're talking to competitors. Whatever the work we need to do, we're, 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 we're flushing it out. Um, we're soliciting the bear analyst at this point. You know, we're, we're talking to, we love to talk to anybody who has a contrarian view to ours, um, whether it's a sell side analyst, if you can find one that's bearish on the name in, in small cap land. Sometimes we find people who are short the stock um, and, and who will talk to us, um, but we're trying to find opposing viewpoints to ours uh, all the time and, and kind of processing our investment thesis. Once we've got a fully baked investment thesis, uh, in normal times, we hop on a plane and we go and we visit the management site, uh, the management team on site. We do these visits in pairs. So I will go, so one of the portfolio managers will go along with the analyst. Um, and you go in, and, and these are done at the end of our process intentionally because it very much is a, uh, meant to be an audit of our work, right? We want to go in with a viewpoint on the business and then engage with the management team on the discussion of that business. And I will tell you, particularly in small cap land, uh, a lot of times, you know, there's not, there's not much in terms of investor, re, investor relations resources or such. And it's usually the CFO wears, especially on the smaller end of small cap, wears that IR role hat. And so we'll talk to them along the way and then say, hey, we want to come visit, set up some meetings and they'll say, okay, well, you know, I've got, get the CEO for 40 minutes um, and we'll show up and, and, and more times than not, if that's how we kind of come in with a 40 minute meeting, uh, we'll get we'll get going the conversation and all of a sudden the CEO has an hour and a half because we've done our homework, we're engaged, we know the business, we're asking nuanced questions about how things work and how the business works versus kind of just wanting to talk about the next quarter or, or, or the short term outlook. Um, but those meetings are very fun, we go and we do them, and then we come back and sit around, the analyst ties up any loose ends, and then we sit around the table and finalize that normal earnings power, right? So we're going from that naive, at the front end of the screen, we looked at 10 years and said, based on just history, what do we think it will earn? So just sort of a simple mean reverting model. We've now done a bunch of work to say, okay, well, based on what we know about this business, what do we think this company earns in five years? And at that point, if it's, a, if it's still in the cheapest quintile, it's a candidate to go into the portfolio. Um, portfolio construction is really an output of this process. So the general rule of thumb in the portfolio for us is the cheaper a name on price normalized earnings, uh, the bigger position it's going to be in the, in the portfolio. Um, you know, we do have sector constraints, Russell plus or minus 15% of the Russell 2000 value industry constraints. Uh, we use those. Uh, if we don't see value in an industry, uh, we don't force ourselves to own it. We go to where we think the opportunity are is, and uh, we're very comfortable doing that. Um, 
The last thing I should say is that uh, we also, similar to our buy discipline, we have a very strict sell discipline. So we buy in the cheapest 20% and then we're selling at the midpoint of the universe. Um, and so uh, you get there two ways. The good way is the stock price goes up. The other way is our normal earnings estimate comes down. Uh, we're constantly filtering any new information that we get about a stock through the lens of how does this impact our view of the business and the valuation? Um, is, it, is it consistent with our long-term normal earnings estimate? Uh, and if it's not, we go right back into the wheelhouse of research review and doing the work that we need to do to adjust our normal earnings estimate and then adjust the portfolio positioning accordingly. Um, so that's kind of the process in a nutshell. Uh, I think it brings things to life a little bit to talk about uh, two names in the portfolio, just to give you a sense of the types of opportunities we find in small cap. Um, and, and these two are pretty different in their nature, but uh, give, you, give you a sense of the, the variety that we find. One is uh, Steelcase. Steelcase is an office furniture manufacturer. Uh, the office furniture uh, business there's really four players that have about 60% market share. Um, and when you think about office furniture versus residential furniture, um, one of the things that, that uh, comes up is durability for office furniture has to be much more so, right? In terms of just the wear and tear of, our, of office furniture, it's a lot more than residential. Um, the other thing that's important in office furniture is if you think about the build out of an office space and cubes and everything else that go into that, um, typically you're getting access to a loading dock for a specific period of time. You kind of have to load things in order. So actually getting your delivery on time with everything there sequenced correctly is important. And, and these are, are durable um, barriers within the office furniture market. But what happened with Steelcase and when we first got the opportunity to invest in Steelcase a couple of years ago, is there has very much been a trend in offices to uh, make your office look like a boutique hotel lobby with co-working spaces and everything else. And these are products that uh, none of the big four really were offering at the time. And so sales actually stagnated and, and, and were suffering as people were buying things from the likes of West Elm and others to decorate their, their office furniture, office to make it look quirkier. Um, so the stocks had sold off on this and, and kind of we, we saw margins down, we saw revenue down when screened up and kind of dug into the issues of whether or not uh, this is a permanent shift in kind of market share within the office furniture space. Uh, you know, what our research found and, and, and kind of what gave us confidence here was that uh, obviously the, the, uh, the furniture companies were very much aware of this trend they were partnering with some of the companies that were providing the quirkier stuff and, and getting into to agreements where Steelcase was showing them how to make their products more durable for an office environment and going to JVs where they'd say, okay, well, why don't you come into our distribution network and we'll have you as an offering. Um, and then it can all get delivered in that, in that same way together. And so they very much had a plan in place for, for, for executing on on kind of this, this headwind that they had been facing and, and recapturing share. And, and sure enough, pre-COVID, um, they were on that track. One of the things that's interesting about COVID, I mean, I talked about downside protection and balance sheets. This is a case where it's so important. Obviously, officer furniture sales went to practically zero post-COVID. Nobody knows, I mean, everybody's thinking about what an office might look like when we go back, but everyone's figuring out how to go back, let alone what furniture you want, um, you know, we're still several months out from people putting in furniture orders. Uh, Steelcase has a has a net cash balance sheet, so they were very able, they're very uh, good position to be able to cut costs, uh, maintain liquidity, and manage through the downturn. Um, and we think they'll be well positioned coming out as orders do come back and as people readjust their offices for the new environment. Um, so that's Steelcase and the office furniture piece. Uh, the other name I wanted to mention is, is, is quite different. Um, this company, Triple S, it's the leading Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, franchise in Puerto Rico. And, you know, we came across Triple uh, S, it screened up probably five years ago for us or so. And when you looked at it and dug in, um, what you saw was Triple S, you know, did have the leading franchise on, in Puerto Rico. 
but it managed it was managed like a nonprofit. It was run by doctors. It didn't really make any money. Um, whereas if you look at what managed care companies make uh, in the mainland, they're incredibly profitable. Um, and yet they were sitting on this investment portfolio of investment grade securities worth at the time, I want to say book value was probably in the 30s and the stock was at $20. Um, so we did a lot of work getting comfortable around the idea that um, there were opportunities to increase the profitability of this managed care business while, uh, you know, it, it, while still having that downside protection if you're buying this at 60 cents on the dollar in terms of the investment portfolio. Um, so we dug around, looked at a bunch of comps, looked at their opportunities. Uh, you know, again, at the end of that process, went down to Puerto Rico and met with the management team and met with this, the then COO, who is now the CEO, who was really tasked with the turning around of this business. And as we got into the opportunities there, you realized that they were running multiple uh, parallel systems on different insurance books. Um, there was all sorts of antiquated costs and opportunities that uh, the COO was on top of. And, and you know, when you look where they are today, they've made some very good progress in terms of the profitability in the managed care book with more to go. Um, as another example of, you know, things happen along the way, uh, at post our investment, you know, so we bought the stock in the 20s, the stock went up, it's actually high 30s, and we were actually trimming it when Hurricane Maria hit. And it turns out, um, you know, Triple S had a small property and casualty business where they blew through their reinsurance covers. Um, so they took a, a significant loss on that book. It wasn't a, a capital event for them, um, but there was fear that, that, that it would be, and the hedge funds were rolling up claims of the islands and it was pretty messy. So the stock went from 39 back down to 16. Um, we were able to add to our position at that point because we had some conviction around the extent of those losses on their insurance book and the progress they were making on the managed care book. Um, and you know, we actually buy their Blue Cross Blue Shield charter, you can't own more than 9.9% .9 of the company. So we topped up to get to that, that threshold. Um, stocks back up to the mid twenties today, but the book value has grown to $40 uh, and they're gonna do over $3 of earnings this year on a $26 stock. So another example of something where it's completely, completely esoteric. When we made the initial position, there was one sell side analyst who covered the stock. Uh, today there's none. And the one who covered it uh, back then thought we were crazy buying into managed care in Puerto Rico. Um, so that's kind of two, two examples of kind of the types of things that we find in the portfolio and the very idiosyncratic things you can invest in, in the small cap landscape. I thought I'd end with just a few thoughts on where we stand and kind of the current environment um, in, before opening up to Q&A. Uh, if you jump over to slide 10, Tim. Uh, so what you're looking at here, this is looking at valuation dispersion in small cap equities. Um, this chart is using price to book. Uh, just because it's easy to measure and it goes back. It's by no, no means the be all end all of, of valuation metrics. It, you know, we don't use it, uh, we use price to normal precisely for that reason, uh, but it does generally uh, give, you, give you a good snapshot of what's going on. And this is looking at the first quintile versus the fifth quintile of valuation. Uh, it's expressed in standard deviation. So when it's, the way to read this chart is when the lines are high, when the blue line is high, Valuation dispersion is wide. So expensive stocks are really expensive and cheap stocks are cheap. And when it's kind of at that zero line, um, you kind of at the historical average in terms of that relationship between the cheap and expensive stocks. <coughs> I would point out that, you know, even prior to COVID, really post the financial crisis, uh, where you kind of were around that sort of historical average line at zero, um, you kept getting more and more valuation dispersion up to about that two standard deviation point. What we saw last uh, March and April was a complete blowout of valuation spreads to north of five standard deviations. Um, we've seen them come back in a bit. Um, and so, you know, it looks like a big move because it was a big move in the other direction, but from an absolute level standpoint, we're still wider than pretty much any other period absent the dot-com bubble. Um, so we think the setup for value for value today 
uh, within small cap is quite compelling. Um, if you look at the, the next page here, you can just see this is a snapshot for around the world for large cap stocks, just to show you that it's not, this isn't just a small cap phenomenon. Um, we're seeing it everywhere around the world um, and, and, and seeing quite a compelling value opportunity. Uh, and, and you can say, that's great, John, but you know, why, why now for value? What's the, what's the case that this isn't just a blip and we go back to kind of a growth dominated market? And, and I think there's a couple things that are worth pointing out um, that, that kind of uh, answer that question. First, if you look at the next slide here, uh, Tim, uh, th this is this is similar data look, looking at it a little differently. The blue lines here is the cheapest quintile on a PE basis for uh, uh, price to earnings. This is uh, Ken, Ken French's data of Fama French. Uh, and then the orange line is the expensive stocks. Um, and what you can see in terms of what's been driving that dispersion in valuations is that expensive stocks keep getting more expensive while the cheap stocks have kind of remained range bound in terms of where they've been. And this dotted line that you've got on the chart here is the 10 year treasury yield, right? And, and so you can see there's very much a tailwind to expensive stocks driven by decreasing interest rates, which makes sense, right? They're just the arithmetic of a multiple is that, uh, you know, a terminal value, you're willing to pay more for out year earnings uh, in a low interest rate environment than you are in a, a, uh, a higher interest rate environment. Um, that's all well and good. And if you look at the, the composition of returns of value versus growth uh, over the past three years or so, um, what you'd find is that the big driver through the third quarter of last year was earning was a multiple expansion for growth stocks, uh, much more so than earnings growth. The earnings growth up until 2000, so from 2017 to 2020, it's actually quite similar for value and growth. Uh, obviously, value stocks being more cyclical were hit a little bit harder um, last year in terms of earnings growth. So, so last year's data, you saw better growth in the growth names, but uh, it's very much multiple expansion that's been the story for, for growth stocks. And what's interesting is you've now had rates basically bump up against zero. Um, and you've seen that even just the move from 60 basis points to 160 basis points in the 10 year. And what's that, what that's done to some of the, the, the growth leadership in the marketplace. Um, the more interesting point now is so, okay, so prospectively, if you're not gonna be driving returns for multiple expansion, where's the opportunity set? And the, if you look at value names over the next couple of years, the, the outlook for value earnings growth is actually higher um, because of the cyclical recovery versus the outlook for earnings growth for, for, for growth companies. And you can see that uh, on the next page. Uh, this is for one of our, our larger cap strategies, but it will look the same across the board in terms of a pretty big decline in earnings in 2020. But as we come back out of this, and this is just looking at consensus estimates, <coughs> you have pretty compelling earnings growth off of a, a pretty attractive valuation starting point. Um, one last thing I'd kind of point out in terms of the opportunity for value today, um, you know, when value goes through its periods of underperformance, uh, sentiment around value gets really negative. Uh, and so we looked at momentum as a kind of gauge of sentiment around uh, value names. And, and I'd point you to page 14 here. Um, this, this is looking at momentum of, of cheap stocks historically, and what you see, the, the yellow shaded areas are periods where uh, value outperforms. Um, and the blue line is a percent of cheap, the cheapest quintile that appears in the high momentum stocks. And you see in the periods where value, you, prior to the internet bubble, uh, the financial crisis, and then this past you know, couple of years, all periods where the, the the overlap between value and momentum gets to be virtually, uh, you know, five percent. So it's, it, versus on average, it should be about twenty percent. Um, so very much out of favor. What tends to happen is, as value comes back into favor, uh, is you get that big spike in in as people get excited about these names and, and ownership 
the momentum changes, the momentum and value overlap as well. And, and you get that kind of sustained period of being a bigger part of momentum as the value cycle plays out. Um, the last point I'd make is just that you know, value cycles tend to be very long and enduring. Um, and if you can see this on page 16. Uh, and so people say, well, John, it's been, it's been six months. It's been a really good six months for value. It's been a good six months for small cap. Uh, is this it? Uh, and if you look historically for these periods where value has had sustained periods of outperformance, you know, six months is just the beginning. Um, you know, they tend to be more like five years on average um, with significant outperformance over that period. You can see that in the column here. Um, and you can see how dramatically value has underperformed in this recent period, really since the financial crisis. Um, and kind of the opportunity set that we think is out there in terms of the overall landscape. So maybe with that, I'll stop there and uh, we can open up the questions and, and I'm happy to talk about names, portfolio, outlook, anything like that. Hey John, it's Steve here. Uh, one question, uh, any particular sectors that look attractive or is it really more a company by company basis? When you look at this stuff? Yeah, I would say for us, um, it's always bottom up, but what tends to be screening in the cheapest quintile for us and has been for a while now is cyclical, economically sensitive names. So financials, insurance banks, industrial companies. Um, and, and if you were to look at our portfolio, you'd see big overweights in industrials and financials, um, things like REITs, uh, the bond proxies, utilities, still not much going on there in terms of stuff that's attractive. So even though it's a, it's a decent part of the, the Russell 2000 value index, you don't really, we don't have really any exposure in our portfolios. Um, it's very much the cyclical economically sensitive. And, and Stephen, it's interesting. If you go back, you know, I think one of the things we all forget sometimes, given how traumatic the past year has been from, from a COVID pandemic standpoint, is, you know, the, the couple of years leading up to 2020, uh, we had been through... You know, the global trade war had introduced so much uncertainty in supply chains that you know, we had had a, a essentially an industrial recession, right? The consumer was pretty strong during that period. But if you look at the performance of a lot of industrial companies, they were really struggling. Uh, and it was, I remember in January and in February, before kind of COVID took root, as companies were going through earnings, we were starting to see green shoots of a, a kind of a, a recovery. Um, in, in a lot of these businesses. And obviously that all got tremendously set back by, by COVID, but we kind of gone through a painful environment already uh, for a lot of these companies. So our portfolio, even going into COVID, was, was positioned along those lines towards cyclicals and economically sensitive names. Well, uh, that probably worked out pretty well, at least relatively speaking. Um, I think shifting gears a little bit, we did have a question come in is when a um, young analyst is trying to learn the ins and outs of a new industry, um, what do you think would be some good suggestions to approach that process? I think, you know, and, and I didn't talk about this, but one of the things we do with our research team is we actually rotate industry coverage every three to five years. Um, so kind of constant, so people are constantly coming up to speed on new industries, And we do that for a couple of reasons. One, one is we think it's good to have a fresh look. Um, two, we think it's good for retention uh, in terms of just uh, it, we hire intellectually curious people that like to look at different things. And also from a institutional knowledge standpoint, you have multiple people who have looked at industries in depth in the process. But you know, I think one of the, the, the most important things to when, when you're coming up to speed on an industry, it's kind of looking at different resources and not being afraid to talk to people, um, right? So, you know, it, you know, company 10Ks can be treasure troves of information um, in terms of just kind of the lay of the land. Uh, if you can find good sell side pieces that kind of give the overview, that's a good way. But then, you know, not being afraid to reach out to a company IR team and say, hey, I'm new to this. How, how does your business work? I'm getting up to speed. Um, 
you know, I think that those conversations can be very productive. Of course, you, you can't just take what they say at their word. You then have to go and triangulate and, and do the homework to kind of say, okay, the data that I can find and in the industry data I can find supports this or doesn't support this or has different dynamics going on. But I, but I think, you know, what I see a lot in kind of in kind of uh, newer members of our team when when they join is they're afraid to to make themselves vulnerable um, in terms of they they want to project that they know something uh, as opposed to just saying you know, I don't know can you explain that to me or, or that doesn't quite make sense to me it's such a powerful question especially if it doesn't make sense to you um, and, and you know and people are people love to share their their knowledge. I think that's good advice, John. Um, that was all the questions we had in the chat. Um, if anyone has anything they'd like to ask to John, though, feel free to unmute. And that's the way now. Um, John, we did have a, a, do you have any thoughts around inflation right now, um, whether that, as it relates to Pazina's specific investments or just I, I have thoughts. I've been I've been wrong for a long time now on this, so I I, I, I I caveat that I've been expecting inflation and rates for a while, but you know, as we look at you know what the response of the pandemic has been in terms of both monetary policy and and fiscal policy, you know, there's there's just so much money that's coming in to the system that hasn't come in yet, and at the same time, you know. You have a consumer, an average consumer, that's in, in probably the best shape they've been from a balance sheet standpoint. You know, savings rates were, were, went through the roof. You know, it can you have to go back to 1946 and World War II to see similar savings rates. And and I think we all have a bunch of pent up demand. Um, you know, obviously there's a there's a there's a portion of of the the, the workforce that has been pretty hard hit. Um, but you know those tend to be lower earners. It's very different than a typical recession uh, in terms of, of where the pain has been felt, and, and there's been a lot of policies trying to help them. And, and so, I, I don't have a crystal ball on, on sort of how this all comes out. But you know, I would think that it would be inflationary as we come through this. Um, and and there's the arguments that it's transitory or that it, it's structural. Um, I, I guess we'll see. But you know, certainly. We don't need inflation for our portfolio to work um, as we see it, but we certainly think it would, you know, it would certainly be a nice tailwind. Um, then you risk it getting out of control uh, with, with all the money coming out there. But you know that's that's what it's worth. But I would have said that yeah, we'll probably see, see inflation eight years ago too, and and we haven't. So again, that's my caveat. Yeah, I think that's a good point. 